That first hymn that we sung reminded me of the I Have a Dream speech by Dr. King when he said, uh, I have a dream that little black boys and little black girls will sit down with little white girls and little white boys at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream. And uh, a very powerful, powerful statement. I asked one of our members... You know, I, you know, you never know if they'll allow you to mention their name. So, Edward, I, you know, I hope you forgive me, Edward. Um, his, he, he, both of their families are very active in a uh, Brazilian ministry, um, Pentecostal, evangelical. So, naturally, I said, so what are you doing here? And he said, without even question, without, without even hesitating, uh, community, community. It's the first time I met you. I don't know if you remember. Well, anyway, um, we all need to belong, and that is culturally written in our blood. There's no age or stage of life where we're free of this need. You be it an infant or even the truck driver. Lonely on the road, finding some electronic belonging on his CB radio. You see, uh, it's in our nervous system. We need involvement. We're always feeling pain when we do not have community. The pain warns us to seek involvement with others. If we fail to achieve involvement with others, there's always one possibility left. Self-involvement, as unsatisfactory as that might be in comparison with the involvement of others, self-involvement will reduce and sometimes eliminate the pain of being alone. Because we need involvement with others. We're calling for it. And it's an inadequate alternative. We can't fool ourselves too long. We become dissatisfied with self-involvement. And the pain of our emptiness and non-belonging returns. And, uh, you know, I've talked to lots of people, mostly um, people who, I don't need anybody. I can do everything, really, by yourself? Oh, okay. Nah. Alienation and estrangement are as unnatural as any conditions for humans. Personal identity and purpose for life are part of the fact and feeling of belonging. Uh, feelings. No matter how much or what we belong to, unless we have a feeling of belonging, we don't actually belong. All of us know people, in fact, that we may be those people who belong to every club in town, who... Um, attend half a dozen committee meetings every week, but who are still lonely and alienated. These are people frantically searching for which should, in fact, be something they already have. You can belong and still fail to have a sense of belonging. Let me explain. Our church, like most churches, conducts a stewardship campaign once a year to receive a promise from people to support its ministry and programs. Now, each year, the appeals are, are, some of them are clever, some of them are not so clever. And to be candid, people do, for the most part, what they already thought they were going to do anyway, in terms of giving. So, asking for money and gently persuading people to make a pledge to this community is a job nobody wants to do. Uh, I mean, it involves asking people to do something they shouldn't have to be asked to do. I think it's safe to say that this church struggles with just enough funds to meet the budget, and it's amazing how they meet what is needed. Sometimes we break even. Other times we exceed the projections. Many churches operate uh, uh, with the lowest common denominator, and that closes the door to church growth. 
and therefore reinforces the notion that additional generosity is unnecessary. Really? This sad cycle is a disease of mainline churches. Embarrassed to talk about tithing, a practice which fills the basket of these conservative churches to overflowing and makes for an unpleasant commentary on the trust and freedom inherent in the voluntary system. And that's what makes this church community so incredible. We'll never ask for any other system other than voluntary giving, for it is part of what we believe about the right of an individual to give as they are able and reflect their sense of commitment to the work of the church. I come from Methodism, and John Wesley, who was um, a, a little bit uh, psychotically schizophrenic, uh, he, uh, he, he wrote 25,000 volumes of theology on horseback as he would ride from church to church as a circuit rider. Now, that would probably give me hemorrhoids. Um, <laughs> Earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. Well, I love the phrase. I have to admit, Brother John had a way with words. But if this system is going to work, then people who have to make the system work must call themselves to task. This is our community. This is our belonging. We must do this, the, the hardest thing, which is to be self-critical. They must sit down and make peace with their conscience. And that means asking whether their gift reflects what the church means to them. Or whether, in fact, lots of other pleasures come first. It means asking whether giving has become a fixed habit, oblivious to inflation, and whether the number of giving units we now rely on to support the total program, whether it, the giving is woefully inadequate. Now, the small pledge made many years ago, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, some people are still at that point. Uh, it's worth half as much, though. And ironically, it's needed twice as badly. And ministers, you know, they're not immune to any of this. They sit in on those meetings and they listen and they want to increase because they have programs that need to be gotten. We're not clergy, inhabitants of Never Never Land, pretending that the clerics don't soil their hands with these, these things. Of course, you know, we, we don't want to appear greedy. You know anybody that's greedy? Don't answer that. But our system, it, it has nothing to do with greed. It just so happens, whether we like it or not, our dreams are tied irrevocably to the money necessary to make them come true. Belonging here, all congregations are aware that in almost every church, a very small percentage of the people bear the financial burden. What most people don't realize is what would happen if the majority, giving small pledges would make just a modest increase, like $10 minimum every week. The increase would result in the total revenue of the church increase would simply be astonishing. Of course, there are some who can't give. That's understandable. But there are some who can give. And that's understandable, too. It is, to be honest, hard for me. I mean, I can't even believe I'm saying these things. Because me, a Protestant liberal, who can't stand those hucksters on TV uh, and their past-the-plate theology. I was watching TV of this one minister, who will be named Nameless. He's building a $1.6 million home. Now, um, I, I would love to have a $1.6 million home with 15 bathrooms and all the accruements. So you all run out and go get that for me, will you? Will you, will you help me with that? Um, but it is because I believe in what our chant, that the church stands for that makes me bold to say this. If this church hadn't laid so much on the line, if... It hadn't done so much and generated so much hope for so many, we wouldn't have the right to be candid like we are. But we did, and we have. And now the most important part is up to you. How, 
affiliated are you in community? Um, to give all you can to the work of the Unitarian Church of Tampa, Unitarian Universalist Church of Tampa, a wonderful church offering hope to a weary world yearning for what we have to offer. For years, for years, I have longed to belong to a church like this. And now I'm asking you to long to belong to a church that bears the label of authentic, as we have never known the word to be used. Now, one of the deepest tragedies of life is that there are so many people that are unwanted. There are so many people that feel unneeded. So many people feel unloved and unappreciated. People do many unhappy unha and harmful things to themselves and to others because of loneliness, alienation, and a sense of non-belonging. Those who do not feel that they belong often compensate by trying to possess both people and things, both of which are spiritually dangerous and virtually counterproductive. I, I, um, I, I heard a commercial on, on the radio. It said, I forget what the, <laughs> the car company was. It says, where luxury and family come together. Really? Well, I want to go over there. I mean, why not? Uh, see, the good life doesn't consist of the abundance of things or persons that we own. There's a, hardly a way you can ever experience a warm and satisfying sense of belonging to something or someone you own. Our deepest and greatest need is not to possess, but to be possessed. In the final analysis, our stature is not measured by what belongs to us, but by that which we belong to. And Henry David Thoreau said it so well. A man is rich in proportion to the number of things he can do without. And I feel that uh, there's much pain in the lives of people. Now let me ask you this. How many people here feel that there's more pain in people's lives, then there is joy. How many people feel there's more pain? There's one, two. Really? Just two? Three, four. How many people... What? what? You, uh, just in general, life. You could, you know, you could summarize. How many people feel that there's more joy than pain? Wow, that gives me hope. See, I'm with those others that said pain. I'm, I, I thought there'd be many more. Isn't that something? Well, I guess I should scratch this sermon then, because the rest of it has... <laughs> Boy, did you guys say, take me a turn there. Um, there's a lot of pain in the lives of people who don't feel that they're accepted by people that they want acceptance from. And each of us may hold the key to some kingdom by saying, enter, come on in, or go, we don't that want any part of you. And each of us can be like beggars, and we would give our right arm if we could just be admitted and accepted, if we could just belong. Now, there's many forms of exclusion which shut out people in various stages of life. You know, you, take, you just talk to some of the senior citizens in our midst. The world does not negotiate for senior citizens. Just ask them. Ask them what they have to go through. Um, we may be excluded from certain economic groups because we're too poor. Or we might be excluded by the poor who don't trust us or by our peers who are in competition with us. We may be excluded by a different generation, younger or older, who don't trust us or who don't understand us. I, I find it's always amazing when I ask people, uh, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a minister of the Unitarian Universalist Church, and I look at their face, uh, you, you, you don't know the first thing about what I just said, do you? No. You don't know what a Unitarian Universalist is, do you? No. Oh. Well, uh, that's too bad. Would you like me to tell you? No, not really, but... Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's... it's 
it's, it befuddles me that people don't know who we are. Because what we are is really great. And it really does share with interpersonal compartmentalization. We've closed the door on some wounded area of our lives. And we don't ever want it open again for fear of getting hurt again. As a means of coping with potential hurt, compartmentalization has some serious implications for those who practice constantly. The walls we build to, to shut out hurt can become a cage or a trap. This emotional hide-and-seek seems harmless as we are in charge of the situation, as we are keepers of the various identities. But the danger lies in self-deception. I mean, think about yourself. Few, if any of us, can pretend very long with human relationships without forgetting who we really are. Self-identity is a priceless possession that we need to navigate in the storms of the sea of life. It doesn't matter whether you navigate through the storms, how you handle the storms. It matters how you dance in the rain. And that's who we are. Self-identity is a priceless possession, and we need to navigate it. To be shut out from knowing who you are is to lose the sense of where you're going. Identity is the chart and compass for life. Who do you identify with? Uh, I met somebody the other day, Thursday night. It was a slow night at the Black Rock Bar and Grill. On, um, what do you call that? Uh, what, that um, what's the road? Yeah, Dale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, you see how I have to have somebody be guiding me? I, anyway, I ended up in there. And I'm sitting there. I'm going to get a little bite to eat. It's a nice place. And there's a man over there. So he looked like he was observing. Um, who, 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 what do you do here? Are you the manager of the like front end? No. Are you a manager of the kitchen? No. Are you a waiter? No. Bus boy? No. Oh, well, what do you do? My name is Craig, and I own the place. You what? You own the place? Well, we had an amazing conversation. Craig Picard wants all of you to come and visit him. <laughs> oh, no. <you're laughs> Craig, I hope, you're, I hope you're watching. I asked him to watch. Um, I asked him a lot about his philosophy. You own this place? He went over things. You know how I was really hooked on this guy? He immediately took out his wallet and showed me his dogs as I showed him a picture of Milo. And he said, uh, yeah, he said, uh, I, I'm sure I'm going to be successful because I, I have 45 people working for me. And every one of those people is contributing to this restaurant's success. I said, wow, that's really great. What's your greatest success? I just wanted to hear it. I thought he was going to say, well, one weekend we had so much revenue and so many customers. No, no. And very quietly, he began to tell me he had a, a worker who came to work, and several of them come to work with all kinds of problems. And he said, um, this one worker, he uh, called me up about midnight. He was about to commit suicide and jump off a bridge. And he said, uh, I, I was on the phone with him until 4 o'clock in the morning. The police couldn't find him. They couldn't find where he was. And we were talking and talking. I wanted him to know that he belonged here and that we needed him. I said, and that's your greatest success? He said, well, you'd have to be me. Because he was so glad that I stayed on the phone with him. that he sent me one of those little pictures of him in the back of the police paddy wagon. And with a big smile, saying, thank you. 
thank you for caring about me that much that I really do feel a sense of belonging to you and to others. That's your greatest moment. He said, it sure is. And I can list you chapter and verse of so many other people. That's what I'm here for. Wow. I never heard that from anybody. And here he is owning this restaurant. It, we, we talk so long. I mean, you, you do know that I talk a lot, right? I mean, I, I mean I, that they had to give me a replacement of my food. It had gone cold. I didn't even look at the food. I was so enamored with him. And when he was talking to me about things that mattered, tears welled up in his eyes. Uh, things you would never imagine. It made me want to work for him. Like, wow, what a, what a... And each worker that I spoke to felt grateful to be there. I think that that is community. I do. I really do. That's why I'm mentioning him. Not so you give business to the place. I just, I just think that when you, when you hear that, you know that that's authentic. So many people tell me, that they've lost sense of who they are. They've had a bad marriage. They've had a bad I incident in their, their life. And now I can get on with being who I am if I can only remember who that is. Of all the different alienation, the most painful, the most dangerous, is alienation from parts of our own life, which usually results in the loss of identity. That young man was saved because... This man tried to convince him, and successfully did so, that he mattered. That he was a contributor to something important. And we all want that. And uh, there's one article I read, I can't seem to place it, and it said, we get our healing from our hurts by a process of self-disclosure. It says that individuals... And social acceptance, when we're willing to open up to the closeted areas of our lives, share our hearts with others. Hmm. Who knows how to help us unless we tell how we're hurting? How can, they, how can anybody know where we hurt unless we talk out our feelings? There seems to be something redemptive, healing in the process of self-disclosure. Something helpful in our willingness to be truthful about the historical and festering hurts in our lives. What's hurting you? That's what I care about. Not that, you know, not, 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 not my hurts, but what are your hurts? And I'm hoping that you feel the same thing about other people. What are their hurts? Not your hurts, but their hurts. See, that is the context of our Unitarian Universalist faith. We would refer to this as community. It's amazing how pride can create walls around us. And there's some shortcuts to acceptance and belonging which we can be shortchanged. I see people are hurting because they paid a high, high price for a low quality of acceptance. How many people here feel they can buy their way into acceptance. They're longing for be belonging. How many people here felt, oh, if I just buy them this, if I just, if I just give of, of myself here, if I, material things. And in the end, uh, we find we didn't do diddly squat for those people. I meet people every day who have a, a, an emotional transaction and their hope of buying belonging. Eventually, they discover that they're operating at an emotional deficit. That sort of transaction has a predictably negative effect. You can't buy love. You can't buy belonging. you got to work at it. And I, It's something like this. I want you to love and accept me. So I begin to do all the things that I know you like. Even when it cuts across my real feelings, I sacrifice who I am and what I really feel. So you will love and accept me. So I will have a sense of belonging. 
You may not expect this sort of behavior from me at all. You probably would accept me just as I am, warts and all, but I'm unwilling to take that chance. I can't afford to have you reject me. So I pretend. And this little game results in an image that you take to be genuine and real. The mask becomes a cage. If I let down my guard and begin to let my real self show, all who have accepted my pretended image will say, what's wrong with Jack? He's so unlike himself. I hurt, but I dare not show it. Not to you. I'm sad, but I must not cry. To you. I'm angry, but no cross word may pass my lips if I show how I really feel and who I really am. You may not accept me. I live in a lonely world behind a painted grin. What I pretended to be is accepted. But beyond the facade is the real me, isolated, alienated, and one step farther from acceptance than before this transaction even started. Have you ever been in a trap like that? Well, I hope you haven't, but I bet you know somebody that has. How many divorces have taken place because that game was played? How many clubs, do you know, have been created by lonely and alienated people trying to create a place of belonging? I've seen people who couldn't even communicate with sincerity because they pretended with people for so long they can't be honest. Uh, reminds me of the poem by Edward Sill. It's really interesting. The Fool's Prayer. The court jester is required to be happy, even when he's sad. The royal feast was done. The king sought some new sport to banish care. And to his jester he cried, Sir Fool, kneel now and make us a prayer. The jester doffed his cap and bells and stood the mocking crowd before. They could not see the bitter smile behind the painted grin he wore. He bowed his head, he bent his knee upon the monarch's silken stool. His pleading voice arose, O oh Lord, be merciful to me, a fool. A fool. And what fools are to try to buy belonging or purchase acceptance at the price of identity. For what does it profit a person if they gain acceptance and friendship in the world and yet lose their soul, their whole identity, everything in the transaction? Now, i got to tell you a secret. It took me 40 years to learn this. See, you do, you do learn something as you go along. <laughs> um, it took me so long to learn it that I'm, I'm still quickly learning to practice it. The sooner you learn it, the quickly, quicker you'll be able to obtain and sustain a sense of belonging. That's what I learned. People will admire and respect you for your correctness, your expertise, your strength. But people will identify with you and love you and have a sense of oneness with you when you let them see your faltering mistakes, hurts, and weaknesses. People will love you and let you into their world when they discover you're as human as they are. If you hide your humanity with sophisticated veneer of correctness and pride, strength, you'll never be admitted into the sacred inner sanctum of the lives of people. You have a longing to belonging. Learn to be who you are. Don't let pride stand between you and other people. Admiration and respect are fine, but there comes a time when you would trade all of that for just one little bit of genuine love and acceptance and belonging. All of us are instinctively afraid of people who have never made a mistake. You know people like that? Never made a mistake. People who are always correct. Learn that lesson about life if you can. You'll be glad you did. I was glad I did. Barriers between you and others will dissolve if you can pretend, uh, quit pretending that you are perfect. Psychologically, theologically, many problems lie in store for those who seek acceptance through pretension. The word that comes to mind is unconditional love. Thank you, Milo. We need to pretend that, that, that we are better than we are, or other than we are, we must accept ourselves as we are first before we move through life 
with hopeful expectations that people will accept us also. And that's what Unitarian Universalist theology is all about. That's what the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tampa is all about. Unconditional love is loving acceptance, giving each of us a sense of belonging where it counts. And then we can survive any kind of rejection. And I, I, I must say, it brings us right back to where we are. This is the church. Can I confess something to you? Uh, somebody said to me last week, you know, we shouldn't be the Unitarian Universalist Church. We should be the Unitarian Universalist community. Well, it really pleases me when the finance committee of any church I've served for all these years has more money to work with than they expected. I love their faces, you know. Like, uh, people are unexpectedly generous. We have an excellent finance committee here of highly competent people who are fiduciarily responsible. Don't ask me how to spell that word. With the church's money. Such a spirit of team makes me humble to serve a congregation of caring people, not to mention how proud it makes me to belong to something I believe in with all my heart. Someone once said, don't tell me what you value. Show me your checkbook, and I'll tell you what you value. That's the greatest place to do so many different things for so many different people right here in this community. Your church needs you. Your church needs your pledge. Whatever you feel good about giving or whatever you don't want to give, it's up to you, and it must be up to you in every realm. I thank you so much, and thank you, Milo, for unconditional love. Amen.